Welcome, all of you. Uh, I'm very, very happy to see the wonderful response that we have received for this uh, uh, for this uh, program, uh, Writers uh, Open House with uh, Otis uh, Andrew Otis uh, Hashemir. So he's a he's a dear friend. Uh, uh, I in 2013, I enrolled in a writing course. in uh, stanford uh, online writing course uh, and uh, after that we kept in touch uh, and uh, in 2016 i reached out to him and said uh, can you do a, a, a writing course uh, so he did a writing course for us uh, a creative uh, fiction uh, a, a creative non fiction and a fiction uh, writing course we we coached uh, uh, 20 people who went through a 10 week uh, course Uh, that was in 2016 and again in 2016 after the uh, writing course we did this kind of an open house for a few weeks uh, and after that in 2020 uh, he did uh, a program for us uh, in, with igen plus igen plus is a, an organization promoted by indic academy and soumya agrawal for children so he did a workshop uh, and he trained so i reached out to him again uh, uh, recently and i said why don't we start uh, the open house on a on a weekly basis and he readily agreed uh, indic academy uh, uh, is broadly uh, doing so many things and i'm sure you would have uh, had a chance to look at uh, what we are doing so i won't go down the path of explaining all the things that we are doing but specifically in writing we take uh, writing very seriously and we are very focused on encouraging quality writing so we have done several uh, activities across the value chain in terms of uh, distributing books encouraging people to read we have distributed more than 10000 uh, books uh, in the last 5 years so we distribute books we promote authors we are the largest organization in the world probably who have done as many book launches we have done more than 176 book launches across uh, various parts in usa in uk and india so we have uh, several chapters uh, where we do this book launches uh, 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 and before the covid we were the, we were doing a number of book launches so we promote uh, authors like that we give uh, research uh, grants to them we have given a research grant to vivek we have given a research grant to vikram sampat so we give research grant to public intellectuals who want to do research we have uh, a jstor connect uh, 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 we have we, we give access to jstor uh, 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 access to research and uh, so that's on the research side then on the publication side also we have an in-house publication arrangement with notion press we also give publishing grants we have given more than 250 250 publishing grants recently and we also publish books uh, uh, at indic academy or under our label then uh, we, we are also looking at uh, literary festivals we conceptualized and contributed to the first literary festival in pondicherry that, that was uh, seated by us we also do panels in literary uh, festivals we've did one in pune we have done one in uh, delhi so we do that so if you look at any author's journey uh, right from uh, right from his uh, uh, you know how do you uh, uh, to reading then uh, writing skills how do you develop writing skills so we also we have given uh, 53 master classes on writing uh, uh, to various people so every month we give out writing classes so we encourage people to take master classes on writing and uh, we also do workshops uh, writing workshops through himalayan writing retreat this year itself we have trained about 85 authors so every month we we train about 10 people uh, so that is the writing part and then of course the publication then the promotion and then the recognition so this is the value chain of a writer we all believe that uh, that every intellectual uh, indic intellectual has to stop uh, on the twitter and facebook and all that and just focus on reading and writing and that's how the narrative will change the narrative won't change because we tweet now uh, tweeting doesn't change the narrative this is our strong belief and then i constantly vitalize on that uh, so uh, i i have uh, abhinav agrawal uh, uh, who is uh, the chief curator for indic book club and if you follow indic book club uh we you know we give uh, various uh, books and contests and uh, you know we we do that constantly uh, we are promoting authors uh so he's uh, he, he's he's the person 
to go to he will be with you and uh, and he will participate in that in in this program uh, so this specifically this program is a free for all uh, that is <laughs> in the sense sorry sorry artist i what i meant was that no, this no, is no 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 i love it i love it this is not a workshop so artist is not going to tell you okay you have to do this this and all that it's going to be reactive and interactive and that's why i wanted all of to, uh, to see all of you and and so if you have a writing sample which you have already sent be sure he would have read it uh, and he would have marked a copy uh, uh, and and then he will come back to you with his comments and the the interesting thing about this kind of format is that you, it's a cohort based so all of you also should privately message each other and become friends and uh, so that you all uh, you know because you learn better writing if you if, if you share your samples and you get the feedback from your other uh, other members so this we will do it every week um, this is a free a free of charge uh, you you can all join and 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 interact with the artists and uh, i'll be most happy if uh, they've also started a new initiative called uh, curating uh, anthologies so we have done we have done, we have, we have done a new anthology uh, on the lesser known warriors of the kurukshetra battle uh, and and that was a, a very very good success we had fantastic response sai swarupa curated that then we we got the entries and then we we the simple question is what did these people think when they got up at four o'clock in the morning on the day of the war? That was a question given, and they wrote a, they wrote a story, and then that now is being published by Bloomsbury. Next month it will be out. So these ten authors are now published by the mainstream publishing house. So this is what has happened. After that, Avtans is curating one book on the flight of deities by Minakshi Jain. The same thing that he is doing that. Then Aditi Banerjee is doing on the lesser known characters of Mahabharata. So, so please check that announcement and you can participate. Tomorrow we are going to announce another thing on the Indic women of substance. Uh, I, I don't know whether you heard this book. In, you know, in my childhood I read this book by Barbara Bradford, Woman of Substance. So we have now coming up with a book called the Indic Women of Substance. We are going to announce it uh, tomorrow day after, and the curator is uh, Mr. Shiv Kumar. So that is that. So we want to curate uh, fictional stories about our civilizational past, imagining, uh, uh, you know, and and then writing the biographical uh, stories. So this is a very important initiative that uh, we are taking. So I, I I request all of you to take this opportunity because Otis is you know one of, I mean he's is a great human being. He's a good friend. So he he will relate to all of you, and feel free. Uh, he he's uh, he's uh, very very you know, passionate about writing, and if you as you will discover. So with those uh, few words of introduction, I very warmly welcome you all to this uh, open house with Otis. Uh, and uh, uh, Abhinav, do you want to say a few words? Yeah, you are on mute, Abhinav. Of course I was. Uh, thank you, Ariji. So, uh, and thank you for that introduction of uh, Indic Book Club. And uh, as uh, as those of you who uh, who are already part of Indic Book Club, uh, excellent. You would have seen our tweets and Facebook posts. And uh, if not, uh, after this uh, session, please do go to twitter.com/slash Indic Book Club, all one word, or go to Facebook and search for Indic Book Club. Uh, so it's facebook.com slash group slash Indic Book Club. Join the conversation. We'd love to hear from readers, writers, and aspiring authors. And personally, on, uh, you know, as far as Otis is concerned, he and I, uh, you know, as Hariji said, in 2016, he had conducted a workshop and then he had also taken some lessons, you know, some, some online classes and sessions. And I can tell you, he's an absolutely wonderful and a wonderful person to interact with, uh, a very, very warm and, and encouraging, uh, which would be the polar opposite of me, if you know me on uh, social media. Uh, and so it's a delight to have you, uh, you know, start these, uh, these uh, weekly sessions, Otis, uh, really looking forward to it. And I'm sure and I'm hopeful everyone will uh, take the most out of it because uh, the one thing that I learned in my journey when I was writing my first book is that uh, knowing the mechanics of writing is 
equally, if not more important, when you actually start writing. Passion gets you started, but you have to know the mechanics, the techniques, the process of writing. So to that end, uh, I, I hope everyone takes the most out of it. And with that, I will hand it over to you, Otis. Yeah, okay, uh, thank you. I'm just gonna jump up for a second and turn on my tea here because it's a little loud. Oh. Okay, well, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Kieran. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Now, if I'm, I like to keep the bar very low <laughs> so that I can try to exceed the bar. So we'll try and, you know, um, we'll try and lower that bar. You'll see that I will, I will lower it myself. Um, I think uh, uh, Kieran's saying a number of things that I think are kind of interesting, this, this idea about, I really, I mean, I really appreciate the, the whole thing that he's doing and the Indic Book Club is doing to emphasize writing. Um, it corresponds with what I think that if we, if we write well, I mean, the, writing well means that we, it, it might be kind of a weird word, but we sort of, we, <laughs> we penetrate the, the, the world around us. We, we, we affect it. Um, and uh, to do that, we have to actually do it well. Um, we, you know, when we're involved in social media, it can seem like we're, we're, we're just in the story. But what we want to do is we want to write the story. We want to write the story that sort of reaches other people. And, and I think that's probably the start of where, uh, uh, the, the start, a place for us to start in terms of our talking. Like, for, for all of you, I've read your work and I really appreciate you sending me your work. Um, it, if you want to be a writer, and a lot of you are already pursuing it professionally, the, the two things that are most important is that you write. So that's going to be probably consistent in terms of what I talk about here is that you write um, uh, habitually, you know, all the time. Don't I, I hope everyone's not going to disappear. If I can't see you, it's uh, it's intimidating to look at all your. your, no, your I just your, requested everybody to switch off the video because uh, uh, it, it, it just uh, from a recording point of view, that's a better thing. I, I don't know. Uh, oh, oh, is it? Okay, um, then we can we can ask them to switch on the videos if you want. You, you, okay, I think it only I think it only records me. Why well, I feel so lonely? I feel like I'm just talking to myself, okay. which I do so, plenty of. So no problem. So we'll 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 keep the videos. Okay, okay thanks. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, the um, uh, what was I going to say? Um, oh, I was going to say that you know that for being a writer is you know you're you know that you write every day. So I really encourage everyone. Let's see if I have an example. If you're not doing it all, if you're not doing it already, I really encourage you to uh, have a, a writing log of some kind to uh, keep track of your writing. A little log book like this is really convenient. A lot of us want to write and we're like, oh, I need to write. And then we didn't write. And then we sort of flog ourselves and say, well, now I need to write even more. And then we don't write again because we have to write even more. And then we're like, by the third day, we have to write a thousand words. And it's like, I'm never going to be able to write a thousand words. How can I do it? So if you, to develop a habit of writing, I do suggest, I go back to my idea of keeping the bar very low. Uh, my rule, it, it offends some people when I say this. I've, I've had people be offended. If you're offended, just go ahead and raise your hand. I'll, I'll get used to that. But um, I say, if you don't meet your goals, lower your goals. That's the way to develop a habit. So try and, um, you know, I, my suggestion is to try and write for five minutes every day, or maybe you want to have some kind of very low word count, maybe 250 words or something like that. I've been doing this for a while, so I have a word count a day of a thousand words a day, but, but I've designed my life to do that, and I have the habit. Um, I don't have to write, use a log book because I've been doing it every day for I don't know how many years. Um, but for you, if you're getting started, try to develop the habit of writing every day. And you can set a goal of writing for five minutes a day so that you get beyond this idea of, you know, I just don't have time or, you know, the stars did not align properly for me to do my writing today. Um, so that's one of the first things. 
And then the second thing that I really appreciate is that you're sending me your work. So that means that you are, you're, you're not just keeping it to yourself. It's a really big moment when you send it out to someone else, someone else who might potentially criticize it, who might say, oh, well, you didn't, you know, you didn't use your punctuation correctly. Um, that's, you're taking a risk. And I think that that's, that's really great. And it, and it shows, if you're taking that risk, it shows that you have a, a degree of personal power, actually, that allows you to take that risk. And uh, I think that that's really great. I'll let you know from my point of view, I, I, I think the way most people teach writing and, and I don't agree with it. I mean, I'm sort of a, I'm a little bit off to the side there because I don't think things like grammar and punctuation are really, they, these are not the most important aspects. These are the things that make us feel inhibited about writing and we do not want to be inhibited when we write. The things that are most important in, in writing, I feel, are understanding the, the structure of storytelling, to understand that, that actually storytelling um, has, well, storytelling has existed for thousands of years, as you know, right? You know, you have, you have your historical stories. Um, you know, in my culture, we have historical stories. We have, we're, you know, I can't remember when I read Gilgamesh, but anyway, we're talking about stories going back th thousands of years. What is that, 6,000, maybe 8,000 years? And even before 8,000 years, there were stories. We're just talking about these stories that were written down, but there were stories that were involved in the oral culture that still exist today. So that's pretty incredible. And so for me, thinking about writing, we want to think about like what has, what, what is it in the form of storytelling that has been so effective for humankind? We have actually evolved. I, I, I actually believe this, crazy as it might sound, we have as human beings evolved with stories. Stories have been uh, a counterpoint to our experience and have helped us define our experience. I think that's pretty intense. So I think there's a lot to be gained by understanding what stories do and then think of our job as being people who want to make stories, right? So making stories, I, I will, maybe add, and maybe this is more on the, the bizarre level, making stories is a little bit different than you each individually being able to do exactly what you want to do. Basically say, I want to, you know, I want to convince the world to all believe what I believe. Okay, that's, I understand that desire. I have that desire. I want everyone to believe the things that I believe and do all the things that I tell them to do and then I'll be in control of everything. That would be awesome. But that's not exactly what we're signing on for. I don't think. We don't get to do just what we want to do and make other people just do what we want them to do. We are trying to write something that's effective, that creates a bridge between ourselves and an audience and the thing that we're gonna use is story, which I think is the most effective bridge <laughs> that has ever been designed to connect people up with each other. Um, okay, so that's a little preamble. Um, let me see if I can share uh, my screen. I, so I just want to go through just maybe a couple little quick things first so you can understand my perspective. And then we can look at your work individually and then you maybe even understand like more important than what I say about your work is why I say it, right? You know, so that you can take those things away. And then if you choose, you can try to apply these ideas to your own work and see for yourself whether they're effective or not. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen here. Um, 
Does this, does this work? Do you see my screen? Yes. Ah, that's good. Awesome. Okay, so I, uh, I'll, 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 I'll tell you another thing. I don't get any kickback, but for my writing projects, I've worked with this program called Scrivener. It's a very good program. Um, it's not that expensive and it's extremely robust. Um, it's a great program for organizing complex works. Um, anyway, and that's what you see here is my Scrivener file for Index Academy. So I wanted to, this morning before we met, I said, you know, I, I thought to myself, like, what are like the, the essential principles of the way I feel about storytelling? And so storytelling to me seems to be a form, and it is a form that <clears throat> has arisen, as I said, many, many years ago. It really arose, you know, with with some of the first human beings who are trying to communicate to each other about things, right? Stories are essentially a narrative, which means that they are a sequence of events, no matter what, a sequence of events. There can be two kinds. We can be either writing a narrative, which would be a sequence of events that happen in life, or we're creating a reading narrative about ideas in which we sequence for example, a thesis statement, and then elements of argumentation along the line. Does that make sense? So there, there's two levels of, of sequences, basically some kind of life sequence and a reading sequence. Okay, I'll just leave it at that. Okay, um, where I wanted to start was, um, I wanna talk about essentially your ideas and my ideas. So I wanted to acknowledge that you have ideas that you want to, you know, put out into the world, you know, your belief systems. I want to say that I have my ideas. My teaching um, doesn't have anything to do. <laughs> Hopefully, my teaching doesn't have anything to do with your ideas or my ideas. I don't have to like your ideas. And, uh, and sometimes, actually, in my reading, it's a bigger problem if I do like your ideas because in that way I can become less critical of them. Um, my, my objective is to talk about stories and stories I think actually rise to a level that's above ideas because the obligation of writing great stories is that we thoroughly and honestly and to the best of our ability deal with both sides of the story. When we, so this is the difference. This is, uh, this is, for me, this is the difference between being in the story and writing the story. Being in the story is that it, we are a person with a point of view and we understand and know our point of view and we basically don't know or understand anyone else's point of view. We're in the story. I'm in the story, I'm trying to, you know, like I said, I have a belief system. I'm trying to make everyone believe what I want. My main belief is that I don't want to have any trouble in my life. I don't want to have any feelings that I don't like, and I want everyone else to be under my control. That's my, that's my desire. Okay, that's me in the story. Me writing the story recognizes that everybody feels just like I do. <laughs> is recognizing that I, I, I'm writing a story and if, even if I'm writing about me, that I'm writing about me in my point of view, but that the other forces, the other people in the story, they also have a point of view that is by definition different than my own and must be. And I have to represent those positions as a writer I have to represent them just as well as I represent my own ideas. When we do that, so one of the ways to talk about this is to talk about a protagonistic force and an antagonistic force. So protagonistic force and antagonistic force is a little bit further down the line. But first, we'll just say that there's points of view uh, of antagonism. We have Stories are about antagonism of two things. Um, and we as writers 
want to be able to understand and represent both those things as objectively as possible. And when we do that, when we do that thing, we impress upon our reader our kind of that that is our skill that is our skill when we can do that then people are moved by our work because they don't feel like they're getting something with a bias or a slant they think that they're reading about life it is life that we are constructing we do play a role because we will um because we are writing it and finally we are going to be involved in the construction of this story but the more we can the more we can render these two elements accurately and objectively the more uh the greater degree of effect we're going to have on our reader does that make sense because they're going to be reading something that feels like life they're not going to be reading something that feels like someone's opinion and that is what i want to teach right so so while and and this has been the case for me in my in my writing career you have your ideas i've had my ideas my ideas have been challenged to the greatest extent by the fact that i've wanted to be a writer and i've wanted to write well that has forced me to see other points of view. So taking it, so taking on the task of writing, you are already taking on the hardest thing that I think, I mean, for me, it's been the hardest thing I've done and the thing that I've loved to do. It, I haven't, it, it hasn't been easy, but by taking it on each and every one of you, you are challenging yourselves to, <clears throat> to see the world in a different way and you will if you take it on with you know if you really take it on you will see the world in a different way and when you see the world in a different way and you present that world you are actually then you will also be a more effective writer i don't know if that all makes sense i i, I better i better keep going so the basic breakdown for me is a story frames a problem okay I want to say that that's the first level of our, our bias, actually. When we frame a problem, that's we are making a decision about something. If we don't frame that problem, it's not a problem. We decide that it's a problem, we frame it. Um, it frames a problem from a point of view, as I write here. Story frames a problem from a particular point of view. So now, rather than just two antagonists, we actually are writing a story a story of antagonism from one point of view. That's essential to the story. That point of view is the one that we want the reader to identify with. So we write from that perspective, but we write the antagonistic force as accurately as we can also. Um, so the problem is a conflict, as I've already said, a conflict means that there have to be two things. This is hugely important for our work. I, I'm speaking across everyone's work right now and my own. Identifying the conflict in your work is something we should do immediately. Now that is not necessarily easy. <laughs> it sounds easy, but it isn't necessarily easy. But we want to identify the conflict in our work immediately because it is the thing that the reader is excited by. They have an emotional reaction to conflict. We want the reader to have an emotional reaction to our work. We do not want the reader to have a non-emotional <laughs> non reaction to our work. We don't want them just to be looking at words. We want them to look at words and feel something. That is a huge, huge thing for us to recognize okay there's no one on earth who sim I, i'm sorry if this sounds harsh i don't mean it to be harsh 
There's no one on earth that simply wants to read our words, okay? Unless we force them to, and you know, if you were like me as a kid in school, we were hit by rulers if we didn't listen, okay? So unless we're forced to sit in a chair and hit by a ruler, no one wants to hear it. Everyone's interested in their own project. Everyone's interested in their own life. Life is amazing, it's out there. My fence is out there, I need to repair it. My, the trees are growing, I can observe the world. Words don't cut it. Emotions created by words, that's what we're after. To create an emotion in our reader, we have to, we, we're talking about um, exciting the sympathetic nervous system. I'm talking about biology. I'm not talking about metaphysics. I'm talking about biology. We put the conflict on the page, we respond to it. Just like you do if you're walking down the street and you see two people break into a fight. You feel something. You feel it. You might feel like you want to run away. <laughs> you might feel like you want to get involved. You might just stand there and watch or take out your video recorder, right? So you, but you feel something. And when you feel something, feeling something means that you are engaged and engagement means that you want to, uh, you, you have some action in your body, some reaction to the work. So, so for one, across the board with everything that I've read and almost everything that I read, and I've been teaching for a long time, and even in my own work, I do not see the conflict identified early. But in some of the best works that I read and works that I teach, and then in time, I hopefully will have some time that I can share some work with you that as examples, they do put the conflict right up front. Okay, so I'm gonna go a little quicker. <laughs> so so <clears throat> when we have conflict, this inspires the question. It gives the reader a feeling and it gives them a question. They have a feeling, uh-oh, but let's face it, we're not watching a fight on the street, so we're not really in danger. So this is something we like. We like conflict. We like to read about characters who are imperiled, but we don't like to be imperiled ourselves. That's why reading is so great. Does everyone, let that sink in for a minute. That's why it's so cool. I can read about a problem, but not be in the problem. That is like, I mean, that's genius. That's genius, right? That is why stories have been so effective throughout our entire evolution. Because we can tell someone about a problem that gives a person feelings, but they are safe. And it doesn't matter whether it's a conflict it doesn't matter whether it's a metaphysical conflict of ideas or a conflict of characters, right? A physical conflict or a metaphysical conflict. We still have feelings from it, but the conflict has to be there. Okay, so we have the feeling of peril in safety. Great. That means we're engaged as a reader. And then the second thing is that we wonder what's going to happen. The, the question, what is going to happen, is the thing that makes the reader do this very, very important thing, which I'm going to demonstrate. <clears throat> what is going to happen makes me do this. That is the most important action that we want to inspire from our reader. <clears throat> Not wondering what's going to happen makes the reader do this. I can't express it better than that. 
Okay, those are the two poles. The two poles are, do they turn the page or do they drop the book? And by drop the book, I mean in a lot of different ways. Okay, so I want us to, to get into this a little bit. Okay, turn the page means I, I'm, I'm leaning this way. I want to know. I want to know what the next word is, the next word, the next word, the next paragraph. I want to find out when I get to the end of the page, I want to turn that page and read the next word, the next word, the next word. It means I'm going this way, right? My mind wants. I'm filled with anticipation. Okay, these two words, put them together. The things we want to inspire in our reader to make them read, that they have anticipation, and then we surprise them with what they get. Having them anticipate something and then getting exactly what they anticipate, they drop the book. Okay, that's the same is true in, um, I, don't, I don't know what, you know, you know like these, uh, these common phrases, like we have a stitch in time saves nine. I don't know. So, but if I, if I write a stitch in time, well, my reader thinks saves nine. If I write saves nine at the end of that, they're completely gone. They already knew that was going to happen. We do not ever give the reader what they already know is going to happen because then they don't need to read our work. Okay, so back into the mindset of forward lean. <clears throat> Anticipation. What's the next word? Oh my God, that word's great. That word is great. That word is great. That word is great. Each and every one of them gives me a feeling of newness. Great shape. We're in great shape then. As soon as we don't do that, okay, right? My dropping the book is extreme, right? But as soon as we don't do that, I want to talk about something less extreme. I want to talk about the mind. So the mind reading our work leans when we're doing it well. But as soon as we don't, it doesn't lean. That is what I'm talking about. It's stopping. It's stopping. It's not going forward anymore. It's stopping, and now I'm thinking, gosh, I have a lot of dishes to do. Gosh, I really do need to fix that fence. Gosh, you know, when was the last time I cut the hedges? I'm distancing myself from the work. We want the reader to be engaged word by word by word. That is my standard. I sometimes express it like this. And I'm, I'm, I'm <clears throat> I really have to redo this. It kind of has some, it feels like violent imagery. And I don't know. But I sometimes say, we have to, we, when we start our story, we grab the reader by the throat and we do not let go. I think it's accurate in this way because remember, again, it's, it's writing, okay? We're not actually grabbing them but we want them to feel something, right? We want them to feel that is, that's what we're doing. We're making readers feel. We aren't writing an intellectual experience finally, even if we're writing a thesis driven argument. And we, for those of you involved in thesis driven arguments, we can grapple about this. We are writing an emotional process that takes place through time. That is what a story is. It begins, it has a duration, and it resolves somewhere. And we have a lot to say about that too. We are providing that to them. And it is, and again, not to, I'm not, I, I think it's on a high level. We're giving them an experience. That's what we do as a storyteller. It isn't about the intellect. It is a kind of enter entertainment. It allows the reader to have an emotional experience without peril. That then resolves in some way. And I will have quite a lot to say about that too. Um, okay, so just a little bit more on conflict. Last thing about conflict. Okay. Those of us who have ideas, we think our ideas are right and all other ideas are wrong. <laughs> right? Basically. <laughs> so if we're going to write a story about ideas, 
or or we think our character is right i'm a noble heroic person and the antagonist is an evil monster you know um i'm incredibly powerful and strong and they are incredibly weak and bad if our conflict involves something that's very big and powerful and something that's very weak like a straw man argument for those of us who are writing thesis driven works the reader doesn't need to wonder what's going to happen. The reader doesn't wonder what's going to happen. It's clear that this side will win. How about if the protagonist is really weak and the antagonistic force is huge and strong? We don't wonder what's going to happen. The protagonist is going to lose. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Put it up on the sticky note on your computer. You know, if your reader doesn't know what, wonder what's going to happen, they're not going to turn the page. I think that this is true. Okay. If you, yes, my mother will still read my work if I don't include a conflict in it, but nobody else will. Okay. My mom will. She loves me. She reads everything I write. This is not our audience. We don't even, we don't, we don't want as an audience, those people who agree with us. We don't want the people as our audience, those people who love us and will read our work no matter what. We want the audience of people who do not love us and do not agree with us. Right, in, in the US we have preaching to the choir. We don't need to preach to the choir. The choir already believes what we think. Preaching to the choir is what I call propaganda. All it does is reinforce people's already held belief systems. Why bother? Someone else can do that work. If we want to do some work that's meaningful, we try to communicate with people who don't love us and don't believe in what we think. And then we try to do our best job as writers so that we keep them involved throughout the entire duration and we give them an emotional experience that changes their perspective. Okay. Um, point of view, maybe we'll, we'll uh, point of view is also now exceptionally important. And again, talking about all, all your work and all of my work for so, so long, right? We need, to, we need to establish a point of view. So there's two things we wanna do in the beginning of our work. We wanna establish the conflict and put the reader into a point of view because it's not enough that there's just simply a conflict. It's also important that we care about the outcome. Those two things what's going to happen and i care what's going to happen right if i don't care okay so um i played cricket so i just want everyone to know and i will gladly tell that story at length but not on you know your time but like in the us we have football teams you know if two football teams meet and i don't care who wins i don't watch right and I don't watch football because I don't care who wins any football game, okay? Same thing for us in our story. We have two things in conflict. The reader has to care. Human beings, I'm going to say something outrageous. Human beings care about other human beings. We care about other human beings, not just because we're altruistic and wonderful. We care about other human beings because we also learn from other human beings. Now you can see the real power of story, right? Is like, okay, <laughs> I can learn. I care because I can learn from another human being in peril and I'm not in peril. 
That's why we care. We care not, not because I finally care about that person. I care about that person as I care for myself. I am trying to learn. I am trying to increase my survival capacity. I'm, I'm trying to enrich my life. I'm, I want stuff. And I feel like I will get what I want through this vehicle that goes through the emotional experience. And that is the protagonist. Um, I will I will always, because I know a lot of you are working on thesis-driven work, um, thesis-driven work, um, and not all on narrative character-driven work, but this idea of having a protagonist is just as important in thesis-driven work as it is in protagonist-driven work, and that's because it is essential to have someone read the story to find out what's going to happen and, and care about it. So we actually have to have a protagonist established in thesis-driven work, and we do, and I can explain that more for those of you who are working in that, and we have to have a protagonist established in narrative-driven work. So whether, so the protagonist in thesis-driven work is actually a, a kind of metaphysical protagonist, and in character, in narrative work, they are, they are a physical protagonist. But they have to exist, and the reader has to appreciate and understand that they do exist or else they do not care. That's my philosophy. Take it or leave it. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's like it might be different tomorrow. No, I don't think it will be. I don't think it will be. I, I think that, you know, it seems right, this is the simple stuff that I was not able to learn when I was uh, you know. <laughs> when, when I was really involved in, um, you know, creating my own ego as a, as a literary intellectual. Okay, when I was creating my ego as a literary intellectual, I was not able to appreciate these simple truths, but I believe that they are true. We're not talking about something, we're not talking about writing work that's, oh, well, this is for, I'm writing work for all these really smart people, you know, blah, da, 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 da. No, stories work. Stories work. You write a story and it will work. So the real issue is, do we want to write a story or not? Um, okay, so let me see what I can do about, I'm going to stop this share. Oh, let, let me, let me, let me put it up. Does anyone have any questions while I'm just transitioning this? Let's see if I can get. Uh, yes, I do have a question actually. Uh, I was uh, I am a person who is trans transitioning from writing uh, nonfiction, uh, the kind of articles I, I have shared with you, one of them, to fiction. So if a person is transitioning from nonfiction to fiction, what are the things they, sh they should keep in mind? And that is one question. And the second question being, you're talking about ideas, antagonist and protagonist. So if suppose a person is writing about feminism and feminism not being seen in a very, uh, the, uh, with a negative connotation to it, uh, the word, when people perceive it as, that way, I would say. So how do you put your idea of feminism through stories? Okay, so a um, uh, great question. Um, well, let me, so, so we understand that my principle, so my principle, so the, the way I look at it, and, and this has been the agony of my lifetime, let, believe me, is that I like, okay, I think that this is pretty true. We need this conflict. I've heard about it and I've tried to think about it and I try to figure out why is everyone telling me this? And so how does it apply, you know, and how can we make it apply to, not not just to the work that I'm doing, you know, let's say I'm writing a short story, but to everything that that ends up being a story, which is what I think is actually happens. I think that so many things are stories. Um, so if you're working on something that's about an idea, let's say feminism, this is how I think it works. And I, I basically go to the tried and true idea of a thesis statement. 
So my, what a thesis statement does is it basically, we, we understand where it exists, right? You know, traditionally when we're writing, we have a thesis statement in the beginning of our work, right? Maybe we write some small amount of contextualization, we make context, and then we write our thesis statement. So obviously the thesis statement is, I think feminism is bad, or I think feminism is good, whatever it is, right? You know, we have that thesis statement. But what does it mean there? You know, what, you know, in terms of the process of writing, what does it mean? Well, in a sense, it's like throwing down a gauntlet, right? It's basically making a determination not supported by any argument. You're simply saying that you're going to prove this thing, right? Because it's not supported, that's kind of, you know, a little bit iffy. Then you have to support it so that you return to your thesis statement with that support behind it so that it has a new meaning at the end, right? But what else are we doing when we throw when we write that thesis statement? What we're also doing, we're throwing down the gauntlet. Okay, so I, I again I go to stories, you know, it's like there's an action, the gauntlet, which is the thesis statement, but there's also us. We're suddenly on the page. We are on the page, whether we're there metaphysically, whether we're there, just there sort of intellectually or not, we're still there. And what are we risking? Who is it that's on the page? Well, in, in fact, the protagonist of a thesis-driven argument is the author themselves, right? Their reputation is on the line. So this is actually very important in terms of the protagonist. So the protagonist, right, the reader wants to read about, attaches themselves to someone in peril. That means that they actually have to be in peril. I'm not, I'm not kidding. Whether they're a character being chased by a lion or whether they're a, um, an intellectual, an academic, a journalist, right? Whoever they are, who's basically imperiled by, you know what, if they write something that's complete garbage, their career is damaged, their reputation is damaged. There's a real stake. It's not just an intellectual game, right? There's an actual person behind it. So that's how I see it. And my reduction, so, and then my, in terms of delineating in a, in a thesis driven argument, and I just wanna interject for those of you, so for those of you who are working on narratives, right, with characters, and here we're talking about thesis driven, I know you can feel like, well, I write stories, and they write thesis driven. I hope that you can see that I'm, I, I try to have all my ideas about stories apply across the mediums. You know, it, like to me, it doesn't matter. Um, but my reduction of a thesis statement is this. Number one, you think this. Two, you're wrong. <laughs> it's this. Okay, so it's basically a three part little thing. Okay, so of, of three parts and I, and I mean them to be emotional, right? Not, you know, obviously they're not reduced to that, but basically you think this, you're wrong, it's this. So that's the gauntlet part. But the you that's being addressed to start with, they are the antagonistic force, right? Um, they have a different belief system than the one that you have. So now you've formed in that thesis statement uh, a personification, if you will, of those who have other beliefs and you've put them on the page. You believe this. You believe that feminism is da 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 da. You're wrong. Feminism is da 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 da. We have the two forces. But now, what do you have to do? And then you throw out the gauntlet. You're wrong. It's this. Now we're looking at the rest of the work. What do you have to do? The main thing you have to do, we all want to justify our opinion, so we're pretty good at it. The harder thing to do is to really get into the antagonist position. But it's getting into the antagonist position thoroughly and well that actually makes that, right? 
you, you've addressed them. They are your audience. You think this. So by getting into their mindset as thoroughly as you can, that is what allows you access to them. But if you don't, if you say, you think this, you're dumb, just do it the way I say, you don't have a reader. You don't have anybody. You're not communicating to anyone. No one is reading your work. The only people who are reading your work are the people that also think that those people are dumb. And you don't need to do that. That's a waste of time. Why? They already think that they're dumb, and you think that they're dumb, so happily, you know, do your thing. Uh, hold on one second. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm probably going to go another half an hour here. Um, so, but um, but you see, like, so like once we make that the standard, though, you see how difficult we make our jobs, right? You know, the the job of being able to say, wait a second, I want to write, I want to write, uh, you know, five thousand words, you know, a thousand words, or 80,000 words about my opinion only. Well, that's pretty easy. And it doesn't require very much of us, right? As we, we actually don't even have to become a, we, at that stage, from my point of view, we're not actually even a writer because a writer writes stories and a story has two sides. Um, I think I might have lost track of your first question. Actually, I asked, I'm, I'm trans transitioning from um, writing uh, like the, uh, the thesis based uh, kind of articles or, you know, informative based articles to uh, complete fiction. So how do uh, I, or what are the points to keep in mind when I'm trans making that uh, switch? Well, if you're writing, if you're writing fiction, then we're talking about characters. So characters in in fiction, we're not we're not using a thesis statement. Though generally we have some kind of you know we might have some kind of tacit thesis in our mind, but we're really trying to represent characters. The most important for us thing it goes back to protagonist and antagonist. So we're going to have some character then who we. Maybe we already have a personal affinity towards them. Like maybe we're writing a character who is like ourselves, for example, right? So we want to try and get them on the page, but we don't want, to, we want to be a writer. Even if we're writing a character like ourselves, we want to try and get a human being on the page. We don't want to just put on the page someone who is seen from one perspective, our own. As a writer, we want to be more objective about, in a sense, about the human animal, as I think of us. You know, we're, we're a character who wants stuff, who's motivated, and who does things in order to get what we want. So one of the places to start with a, with a fictional character or a nonfiction character, any physical character, is to figure out what they want and what do they do to try and get it. The story begins really when the antagonistic force comes in. Maybe it's a person and we want to get them on the page. They're not evil, right? This person thinks that they're evil, but we as the writer don't think that they're evil. They're just another human animal trying to get what they want. And these two things are diametrically opposed. And that's the start of a fiction story. The more, one of, an important principle for us as writers is, I mean, it, and this is, it's really a life work in itself to differentiate between the protagonist and the antagonist, to start with that, differentiate between these two forces, understand that we must have them. If we don't have them, we have already failed. So we must have these forces. It's just, I don't like it. I don't like having to write conflict all the time. I would like to live in peace and harmony, but I, I think that that might be a little bit like death. So we just have to do it. 
we, we need to identify those forces and get them on the page, whether we're writing a thesis or whether we're writing um, a fiction. And there's no time like the present because it's, you know, um, let me, uh, let me continue to, I don't, I, I want to touch down a little bit on the work that I have written up. So let's see if I can do that. <clears throat> um, story. Okay. Um, Oops, <laughs> I forget which screen I'm using. Okay, um, okay, these are the works, uh, these are the works that I was able to, so <laughs> my, my screens have changed. I'm looking here, looking there. Okay, let me go, let me go like this. Oh gosh, what am I doing? I've lost you all. Okay. So it's, this is, sorry, I'm just doing a little screen adjustment here. Okay, so in this uh, open house, which uh, I really appreciate uh, Kieran uh, putting this together and, and drawing me in and, and yeah, we've, we've known each other for a long time and I'm really happy with our, with our good relationship. And, uh, and I've really enjoyed my work with, uh, Indic Academy and, and, and through him, it's, it's really, I've, I've gained as much, I, I've, I've gained more, I'm sure, from the interaction. Um, so I just want to uh, highlight that. Anyway, so, so in this workshop, as I see it, 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 is, it is an open house and you're all welcome to submit something else for next week. You know, if we just keep it short and we use it as kind of a stepping stone, really, which is awesome that you provide that we use it we'll use it as a stepping stone and and next week we'll do it even more so i i promise um to to talk about general principles using your work and we can keep it going and submit work and if you don't have work it doesn't mean you can't come to you know this workshop come and listen i am i'm very casual i'm very casual i if you you're the one who wants to do the work, and that impresses me. And and it's uh, it's it's wonderfully easy for me to be here and be of use to you. You know, so um, so I hope you'll do that. And if you submit it on PDF, which I do prefer, I will put it into my program on Notability, and then it will um, end up uh, looking like this, right? So so I can just write hand notes on it. I know they're not as intelligible as typing, but they're a lot faster for me. And hopefully, and honestly, it's not about the details. It really isn't. It's about um, you submit work. I say some things. You don't have to listen to what I say, but have it shake you up a little bit. You know, have it make you consider a little bit differently. Then you come back. You're doing the work. I'm not doing the work. I, you know, honestly, the details don't matter. We're going to talk about storytelling, and that is the thing that's going to matter. The more we start talking about storytelling, the better, and the principles of storytelling, and that will influence your work um, and make it better. I, I promise it does. I, I mean, for whatever that's worth. <laughs> it's like, I'm not going to be held accountable, so I can promise all I want. Okay. Um, oh, this is a piece. Um, is uh, Savita here? Savita Sadin? I don't, I don't know who's here or not. Uh, it looks like Savita. Savita may not be here. She's not responding. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, let me talk. Let me talk about this a little bit. Um, anyway, I I made a promise not to talk about people's work if they weren't here, but. Um, yeah, you can so, go. You can ask for others who are here. Uh, uh, people who are, uh, I think, uh, can they can they just raise their oh. hand? Okay, so 
so this, well, okay, this is the work that I have. Does someone want to jump in? Hey, that's a good idea. Jump in and these are the, you can see the works I have. I have my granddad, Salamba, uh, Salambam. So um, let's, um, let's start with granddad. Let's start with granddad. Uh, my granddad? Okay. Okay. Um, oh yeah, I like, who, who is who written, who wrote this piece? Is, are they here? As no? the person who's well, written the piece, granddad here? No? Okay. Um, I saw so, Anvita okay, here. So, Anvita, uh, uh, perhaps you can start with the writer's open house by Anvita. She's here. You can, you can ask her. Anvita, are you here? Uh, uh, yes, I'm here. Okay, good. So we have one person who, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and Anvita, is that, oh, is that this piece? Okay, okay, yeah, let's talk about this piece. Okay, so this, I, you know, this is a, a piece, it, one of the things that we don't have is we don't have everyone in the workshop reading everyone else's piece right now. Um, and we can see whether that's advantageous. It, it becomes, you know, more work, obviously. Um, and, and, and we can see whether we develop into that. So for now, unfortunately, only I've read the work, I think. Um, and this is a piece about someone who finds themselves in a hospital um, and is being rushed to surgery, it seems like. And the, the last moment, which is very, <laughs> very creepy uh, to me, but I, and one I remember too. So I, you know, like I remember, I, I don't know if they still use the same gas, but it, ah, it's awful. The smell of it and then the recovery from it is horrible. Um, so this piece is extremely uh, visceral. What I really like about this piece is it's doing something that uh, that I think we really. Okay, so on my little list before I had POV, okay? And from now on, I'm just gonna write POV and you, you're gonna know what that means. And that means point of view. Point of view is exactly that. It is a point from which the view takes place, okay? And that means that it has a bias, okay? It is individuated. It is not like we as writers, we, try to know all points of view. We try to, we understand that individuals have points of view, et cetera, et cetera. But we want to get really good at, as writers, understanding other points of view. We already have, some, we, we don't understand even our own point of view as a point of view. We tend to just understand it as truth incarnate somehow upon us. But, but we want to start to understand that we have a point of view and everyone else has a point of view. So we want to get good at that. And this piece demonstrates that. This piece demonstrates the ability to get into point of view. And the way we get into point of view, particularly with characters, um, with metaphysical projects, it's harder. We have to get into the point of view of our protagonist and our antagonist by exploring ideas. Harder to do, probably. With characters, for some reason, it's also hard. I don't know why. But with characters, it's about going to physical details. That is, write that down. If you want to get into a point of view of a character, you go to physical details. And by that, I mean sensory perception. Have I told you that my mom was a biochemist? Anyway, I had a little bit of a science thing going on. I obviously rejected science, becoming a writer. But I still have a little bit. Anyway. Sensory perception is incredibly important. That's how we get into point of view. And that's what this piece does so well. Um, and we know it right away. Uh, the, the writer here knows what she's doing. Oh, sorry, I lost my piece here. I gotta go here. Ah, right, come on, go. Sorry, that's my daughter playing violin dressed up. We don't dress that way normally, okay? So it's a costume. <laughs> you see that glare she has? See that glare? I get that every day. I get it every day. 
scary. It scares me every time I open up my computer. Sorry, this thing is glitchy. Okay, here we go. Um, okay, so we we'll see it right here, the smell, right? Um, we get that. Make it go away, please. The whole world is full of white, green, and blue. So what I even like this, too, the whole world was full of white, green, and blue. We're so deeply into the point of view that we're actually not experiencing her seeing, you know, or the character. I'm, I'm not sure this is she, but that the... We're just perceiving the world and the colors of the world, but it is sight, and we're being immersed into this point of view. Um, and this takes place throughout the entire piece. We're sort of riveted by these physical details. That's how you get into point of view. Okay, so that said, what are the things that are not happening in this story? So, so how can we make it a more effective story? So according to me, right, we want to have some, some kind of isolation of, oh, maybe I'll make this, uh, some kind of, I, I'm just putting this over the words, and, and kind of purposefully. I, I want us to start to see that the words themselves, like the details, they're not as important as what the words are doing, what they're getting on the page in order to create the emotional reaction from the reader. So in this, in this story, we get a lot of point of view, and we get essentially what I would say is one dimensional point of view. But what we don't get is, and I'm just going to go like this, we don't get, we have the protagonist, so protag here, but I don't know really what the, what the conflict is. I mean, this might sound strange when she's fighting for her survival, but it's not being, I, I'm a reader. I'm lazy. I'm slothful. I want to experience peril in safety. So that should tell you everything about me, okay? I am not an adventurer. I am not, right? I'm a simple person <laughs> with simple, you know, wants and desires. And so I want it laid out for me very clearly. What's so, that issue? So Otis, we have uh, uh, yeah. uh, we have someone who's asked we can't view the story. I'm wondering if you want to do that. If you want to share uh, that part of your screen where or you know open up uh, and share that, or you'd rather not at this point. Wait, I'm not sure. What they can't see? You can't see my shared screen. No, we can see your shared screen. We can't see the story. Oh, you you didn't open it. Uh... You, you just opened the index. You didn't see the... Oh, oh sorry. On my screen, it is open. No, okay, I'm sorry. Oh. Something oh, happened then. This is not open. Let me try sharing it again. Sorry. I, I uh, from my... Uh, we there we go. An... You were just staring at the index. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. I did not know. Look at that. A perfect uh, indication of point of view. Correct. We point of view in, in demonstrated, because from my point of view, I was looking at my screen, on my screen. Yes, we can see the, okay. the, the story now. <clears throat> okay, so that, that, right? Interesting. That's what I was looking at a moment ago, and I thought we were all looking at it, but you see, I was so wrong. It's an object example. I love it. Okay, <laughs> so... So I'm actually, I'm just drawing over the story as, you know, to say we want to try and, you know, the first thing I noticed here, of course, in this, in this work is that there's no paragraphs. Okay. And I know it can seem like, oh my God, you know, why is Otis such a school marm talking about paragraphs? Why does he talk about sentences? Because they help the reader. They help the reader differentiate. So as, as this, and, and the way things look actually, I know, again, that it sounds like, what about the story? But all of these things contribute to the way the reader understands the piece. And as uh, Strunk and White have said, make the paragraph the unit of composition. So one thing that we can do in our work, if we want to, when we go to rewrite it, and I hope that this writer will rewrite this, because I'm really excited to see what this might turn into with some of these ideas added to it, is that we might make a paragraph 
that describes the protagonist, right? But then we might have a paragraph that describes the force of antagonism. Sorry, I'm, sorry, I'm in my uh, highlighting mode, right? So now, if we, if we look at it that way, I can see clearly, I'm gonna read in a paragraph, I'm gonna understand that I'm in the point of view of this protagonist, and then, because I'm so deeply in point of view, what I kind of want to do is I want to actually see the antagonist from this point of view. This is the work that the author, you know, the writer can do to, again, to go back to this idea of you want to really differentiate the forces and understand what the conflict is. So um, let me... Um, um, so that, that was, that's sort of like my big general take on that piece. I enjoyed it very much. I really liked being in the point of view. And I think that the, the writer shows her capacity to get into that point of view physically. So, so while I'm, I just want to underscore that. Okay, for, for those of you who think that that's some small thing, I am telling you, it is not a small thing. That is a great attribute to be able to do that. This is, that's an imaginative capacity that many of us, I'm promising you, many of us lack. And we need to work on it, right? So she has that. Now I would like to see some form. So like, while I can vaguely understand what's at issue, you don't want your reader to vaguely understand. You want them to feel the conflict. And that means, so I'm gonna go back to this. That means you take, you have two things that are diametrically opposed to each other and you bring them together, juxtapose. So when I do this, I do it on purpose. It's, the, it's this impact, the juxtaposition of those two forces that we want to get on the page and we want to get it on the page clearly. Not, not clearly, it doesn't necessarily mean, and the problem was this. I mean, you might do that. Maybe that's a good idea. But we want to juxtapose those forces so that the reader feels the impact of these two forces. Does that make sense? It's a, and like all of this, you know, what it, that I'm saying here might sound like, kind of ethereal, right? Kind of ethereal. I don't mean it to be. I, I, I really want to, again, emphasize that we're really talking about making things and putting things on the page that inspire emotion. That's what we're doing. Um, the, um, let me, is there, is there another, piece uh, here that we might be able to look at quickly. I, I think I, I'm going to have to go in a few minutes, but um, is there someone else here? Maybe we can talk about one more. Anybody else? Uh, raise their hand, please. Uh, Subra Prakash has given. So if, what is your piece, Subra? Please unmute yourself and... It's called Urai. Okay, let's look at it. Um, okay, so we go there, we go there. Let's just adjust that for a minute. Someday I'm going to figure out these two screens. Um, okay, let's look at Oray. Oray, you said? Oh yeah, I enjoyed this too. Um, let's see, this, so in this piece, um, we, so there, there are a couple of things that, that happen in this piece. So point of view, the words that we put on the page express point of view. I, I, I found this piece very charming. I really love this environment, and I 
and I enjoy these characters, and I enjoy this story about writing, and I and I really and I enjoy the depiction of, in a sense, it, we we go from we go from a narrator um, to the father at a young age. I, this is I, if I have something wrong, you know, just forgive me. I, I do the best I can. Uh, a father at a young age. That, and then we go really, the, the person who becomes seemingly the principal character is the younger brother of the father, uh, so the uncle. And it depicts this moment when, they're, when the father is slightly older, the, young, the father is, is painting you know, these letters and the younger brother, the, the older brother is called away and the younger brother is sort of left there feeling like, well, something needs to be finished here. But it's, but it's further about his, his sort of awakening to, um, to really the, the symbolism of letters, right? I mean, the, the, the fact that, that these things convey other things and there's a way to create some kind of sense of completion about what that thing is and in a way almost bring it to existence because of, because of this act. So it's really a, a, a wonderful like moment of, uh, you know, kind of a moment of enlightenment for this child. And, and what I really like about that too, is I think that, um, you know, the, the writer has done a great job again in point of view. So the writer has been able through the process of this story or maybe automatically to be able to really imagine what this experience was like for the younger brother in point of view which means that um, she accessed that point of view by using physical words of physical character and physical perceptions and physical actions, right? And then by doing it that way, and this is the important thing for the reader, has allowed the reader to engage in those physical actions from a distance, right? Through language has allowed the reader to engage in those physical actions and find the same sense of enlightenment. Does that make sense? We, the reader uses the character and the point of view and that uses that physical character, the protagonist at this stage of the story, uses that protagonist as the vehicle for, their, for the reader's experience. Does that make a little sense? That's what the protagonist is. This is something we can score, underscore for ourselves. The protagonist is the vehicle for the reader's emotional experience. I don't know. Take that and print it. That's, that's done. You know, so that's a really great thing to be able to do. The difficulties in this piece are also involving point of view. Okay. So, which is just, it's just a confusion because the words that we put down basically create the point of view for the reader. So whatever word we put down becomes the sort of point of view of the story. And in this story, that point of view wanders a lot. So we don't know, again, I would say like, I'm, I'm worried about what's gonna happen here. Oh, okay. So again, what I would say is, just like I did with the other story, I think we're, we're better off getting our protagonist out there, protag, uh, pro, sorry, sorry, I know you can't even read it. It doesn't really matter. They're just shapes, okay? But I think we're better off in our storytelling to get to really understand what are the forces of conflict in the story and get them on the page up front. That means that we have identified, as I said in the beginning notes, we've identified the protagonist. Who is this story about? And we get them on the page and we make the reader care about their experience. And second, what is the force of antagonism that is stopping the protagonist from getting what they want? This is the conflict. And this is the thing that makes the reader say, what is going to happen? Um, here we have a little bit, um, here we have a little bit more of like, we're on a winding trail. We're like, we're, we're like a rabbit going into a rabbit hole. You know, we start off with the, with the writer. Um, we have the small town. Um, we have, so when I read, we are in a small house, 
what point of view am I in? When I read that word we, what's the point of view? The point of view is we. I don't know who we is. It's okay if I'm going to find out, but I'm not going to, right? So when I read we, I'm in we's point of view. We are in a small house. Okay, that's my point of view. Fine, I'm, I'm okay with it. I'm going with it until I can't. The moment, if I'm a reader, if I'm, a, if, if I'm like a reader at a journal or something like that, the moment I don't know what's going on, I do that thing where I, I go like that, right? It's no fault of the story. The story here is, is charming and wonderful and what it deals with is great and definitely the subject of a story. But if I don't know what's happening, if I'm confused, confusion is one of the things we never want our reader to feel, okay? When our reader is confused, they become insecure, and then they go do the dishes. We do not want our reader to feel insecure, okay? The other thing we don't want our reader to do is to feel bored. So that's that anticipation and surprise. So we want, we want them to be, we want to like a, um, a sweet spot in the middle of not being bored, so that means it's complex enough but not so complex as to be confusing. Sweet spot. Okay, so as I read here, you know, when I get to we, oh no, please don't mess up. Okay, are you, do you still see the page? Yep. Okay, okay, so when I get to, uh, when I get to, uh, so first I'm in a small town, okay, so I don't know how I'm in the small town physically, but then I get, we're in the house. Um, at eight years old, my father, and now I'm like, I'm, I'm a little confused. At eight years old, my father, I don't, because we just did, we just did a whole bunch of, so one of the ways we can confuse the reader is with time. We can confuse them a couple ways. We can jump in points of view because we as a writer, right, we know all points of view and we can go to any point of view we want, but we want to limit ourselves. It's through our limitations that we create something that has integrity, right? So we don't want to jump into a lot of different points of view, but the other thing that we can do as a writer is that we can jump through time, right? I mean, we're like a God in our story. We can do anything. We don't want to do anything, okay? It's very important we do, that, we don't, that we don't do anything we want, but we try to organize the experience and usually the way I think of organizing the experience is in two ways. Being very organized in terms of the point of view, being very organized in the differentiation of the protagonistic force and the antagonistic force, and being very organized in time. Those are the three things. Uh, there's probably a few more. Um, and anyway, so uh, just to, to make it a little briefer, so in this story, we start with, we, we get eight years old, my father, which is hard for me to comprehend. I'm, remember, I'm an idiot reader who's simply, the main thing I want to do is not do the dishes. So don't do anything that drives me to that, please, right? That's the main thing I want. I want to escape from my world into your world. Don't do anything that pushes me out. That's the rule. I've already told you I want to go to your world by picking up your book, by opening the page. I've told you I want to escape my world and go to yours. Do not abuse that. Mm. Right? That's, mm. that's, the, that's the thing. Um, so just quickly here, we, we, we deal with, you know, we, we go to the father and then we have the, what the father is doing and then we get to the uncle down here. So we're just moving through a lot of different points of view. And for me, that's not organized because I don't know what the essential conflict is and I don't know who it is that I care about particularly. And so those two things, understanding those two things, and you can see that that would create quite a big rewrite, but now we're forming something that's like a story. And so the difference between the work as it is now, which is charming, and yes, the, the, you know, there, there are people who will read about it who care about you, are interested in you, and interested in what you say, and agree with you. But that's not who we're trying to get. Mm -hmm. We're trying to get people who don't care about us, mm 
who aren't interested in what we say. And the only thing we got going for us is that they want to escape their world and go into ours. Mm -hmm. That's all we got. And so when we take it from this level where it is now up to the story level, and it is absolutely worth writing a story about this. When we take it up to that level, I hope you can appreciate that the, the level that, that, that it's risen is really incredible. I mean, ridiculous even, right? So it is worth the work. Um, I think the, I'm going to stop the share, sorry, I'm going to have to. Thank you. Um, I have a question here, can I ask? Yeah. Just yeah. So uh, yeah. when you were saying that you want to uh, introduce the characters and antagonist or protagonist, where, where, where should we start? Should we start in the first paragraph or give them and uh, introduce them in the second paragraph? What would you suggest to me to do that? And also suppose I agree with the antagonist more than the protagonist. I want to bring gray shades in the character, not black and white. How do I do it? <laughs> well, okay. Well, one of the questions you're asking about are just, one of your questions is just about talking about print, basically. It's mm -hmm. talking about the problem of language being a linear form that goes like this. So yeah. that's one kind of problem. How to get your characters not to be black and white and, uh, you know, one dimensional, that is a much bigger issue. That requires, that's where our real work is done. This is our real work. Our real work is in understand as writers is in understanding people, not and not just ourselves. But it does start with understanding ourselves. I do believe. Let's start with understanding ourselves. At least we have a captive audience, right, to to investigate, and then we can start trying to understand other people too. But we have to really try to make those moves. But in terms of uh, laying it out, there's really a couple different ways. Um, I, uh, I don't think we have time now, but, but next time I'll, I'll show you a short story by uh, a, a colleague of mine. We were at Stanford together, Zizi Packer. It's a story I use a lot in my teaching, but she does this very well. Um, in fact, you, you'll, find that you'll find if you read some of the best writers, the writers that you, that you love and you really respond to, you will find it being done. So you can find examples of this basically everywhere because this is part of the story form, I think, and seems confirmed when I read, right? But, but kind of you have, so in, in my friend's story, what she does is she has the first sentence. It is actually kind of a, I would say for the most part in the story, we tend to alternate between the protagonist and antagonist points of view. If we're writing a thesis-based work, we present, we might present their argument, right? And then our argument, and then their argument, and then our argument. And we'll notice as we move along that it's always escalating to the largest, deepest, most considered argument. The same thing happens in a story between characters. We might have, you know, I might say, um, you know, uh, here's an example. Uh, you know, I, I, I walked into the kitchen, um, you know, uh, sweating and bruised uh, from the beating that Johnny had just given me. Okay, that looks like this. That's a little box. My mother stood at the sink, um, washing the dishes and humming a song. So what did I do right then, right? I just put me and then I put my mom. The story form is already helping us. We've been listening to stories all our lives and human beings have been listening to stories for 8,000 years, 12,000, right? So we, and conflicts between things that are important to us have been happening even before we had any language, before we were even human beings, right? So these things are very consistent in terms of our total evolution so we use those things to our advantage. And so the answer to how do we present it on the page is juxtaposition. Put them next to each other and the reader gets it. But we have to, but they will not get it if we do not have distinguished things put next to each other, right? If we just have this, the reader can't get it. 
So we have to identify this and we have to identify this. For me, it's the boy who's beat up and the mom who's interested in her own things. Boom, juxtapose. It's, it's so funny because what, what I really come back to all the time is physical, right? We think of our stories and we think of even our thesis driven work as being about a bunch of ideas, but finally we are making a physical representation of something on the page. Use that to your advantage. It's not a bunch of abstract ideas. It's going to be print on the page. I printed these words about me being beat up and bruised, and I printed these words about my mom standing there humming a song. Boom. Physicality. People respond to physicality. And that's what we're trying to do with our language. We're trying to make human beings respond to the world around them and you know, with our work and we're presenting it to them. Respond to this. I don't know, that's getting a little weird and esoteric, but you'll forgive me. I think I have to go about my day. I'm sorry if I did not get to touch down upon your work. I've sent, I have tried to keep everything organized. I've read your work. If you sent me your work and I was able to read it for this class, I have now sent it back to you. If I've missed someone's work, tell me I'm not slighting anyone. <laughs> you know, uh, so I'm not, I have not done it on purpose. I'm not like, oh, no, uh, it totally could be me. It's like, he hated my work. He didn't even send it back to me. No, uh, it's not that. I try to get everyone's work back to them. Um, so you should have that. And I think if this process works okay, I'll probably do something similar for next week, which is send me your work throughout the week. I will, you know, probably... This is Wednesday, so probably on Monday, which is what I did this time, I'll start reading work and I will send it back to you. You know, uh, I guess it's for you, it's going to be Wednesday uh, morning. And, uh, and then so you can review the comments and then we can talk about it, you know, when we meet. And if that seems good, but I'm totally flexible. Flexibility, you're becoming a writer. You have to understand you have to be so flexible. I mean, it's just... And, and why not? It's easy. Um, and uh, yeah, and if you send it to me, please do send on PDF. It's a little bit easier for me to mark um, than, than Google Docs or any other kind of form. And then I will send it back to you. You can review it, and then we can talk about the pieces uh, when we meet Wednesday night. Don't bother to <laughs> read it and respond to me because I'm asleep. <laughs> Thank you, Otis. Thank you so much. Uh, some people have asked... Uh, you can send the, I've given the email in the comments box. Uh, you can also see his email in the announcement itself. So please put the subject matter saying that it's open house uh, and Indic Academy so that he will know and he will put it in that bucket, uh, in that folder. And uh, thank you so much, Otis. That was uh, very useful, very wonderful and insightful. Uh, uh, Abhinav, uh, you want to have any yes. comments? Yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Otis. Uh, very useful, pertinent, and I'm, I'm sure in the coming uh, weeks, we'll be covering a lot more topics. So, uh, so folks, a couple of things. As Otis said, you can send those uh, submissions in PDF form. And as Hariji said, you know, uh, preface the subject line with the Writers Open House Indic, uh, Indic Academy. Also, uh, we have a conversation going on. If you want to engage with other writers, readers, and authors, you can join the Facebook uh, group, Indic uh, Book Club, and uh, you can, you know, you feel free to share your writing samples. You can give, a, you can ask for advice. You can, you know, provide your own feedback, suggestions. So, this is not a one-off. It's a, you know, Indic Book Club is part of uh, facilitating, nurturing, and creating good, better, and even better writers uh, and readers both. So please do make uh, use of that opportunity. Yeah, Thank and, you. Oh, can, I, can I also add too, I am, I, I just, like I said, I'm very flexible. If you, if you want to let other people know that, that you're doing this and you found it fun, or maybe you didn't find it fun, but you're like, hey, you can try it. You might not find it fun like I did, but you can come in, you can come in for one. I, yeah. I'm happy to work 
with any, anyone. I awesome. love reading your work and I love engaging in work. And I, and I really, truly, it's not, you're the one that's taking on the challenge and I really um, uh, respect that. And I, I, think it's, I think it's really great. So I, I appreciate you for doing thank, it. And thank you so and much. So I believe encouraging. in stories. I, I, know, I know Kieran is, you know, we're of a similar mind about this. Telling your story, getting your voice out there, getting it heard is so ridiculously important you know, for us personally and important for the world. I really believe that. So I am, I know that I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to work with you and, and, and help you do that to, to, to whatever degree, you know, you, you aspire to. Thank you. Thank you. So Arthur. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Otis. So nice. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. you. Otis. Thank you everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Good day. Bye.